Anybody else? Thank y'all for having me. Can y'all hear me pretty good? Does this thing work? Yeah. All right, cool. I know it kind of gets distorted, but I talk real loud, so it blows up. Just think of it as like a cool effects pedal. All right. Hell yeah. Um, sweet. Thank y'all for having me. I really appreciate it. I lived in Austin for a while. I'm from Houston. Um, I'm in town. I've been traveling uh, all over the U.S. talking about single pair. Um, health justice, health inequality, health injustice, how that kind of shakes out across the U.S. Healthcare is a national fight, but healthcare needs are local. Learning what healthcare looks like in Pittsburgh or Brooklyn or Cleveland or San Antonio or Austin is really important to kind of understanding what we're fighting for uh, kind of across the country. I happen to be in town because I run a wrestling league. We have a show tomorrow. Uh, uh, and so I emailed a, a Greg Kassar in Austin, DSA, and y'all were so gracious to put together a joint event. I'm really, really amped on, uh, on paid sick days. We'll talk about that a little bit. I think the arc of this is, I'm going to talk about single payer and health justice. We'll talk a little bit about paid sick days and I kind of fit within that purview. I think Greg is going to talk about the paid sick days um, uh, initiative, and we'll do open Q&A. And then, please, ask me cues that I can A. And then I'll ask you cues that you can A, because I really, really want to understand what it looks like kind of up, up across the U.S. and what health care looks like in Austin. I also want to thank Greg for coming out to this. I've known Greg a little bit. He, uh, last time I saw Greg... Woo! Last time I saw Greg was in a wrestling ring. We exploded into a pit of snakes. Um, <laughs> so hopefully we get a repeat tonight. Um, that'll bring some flair to the, uh, the, the, uh, the Hate Sick Days initiative. But right now, I want to talk about health care. I want to talk about uh, where we're at now, right, and who it benefits, what we want instead, and why we're told we have to uh, accept something else in its place, why that's wrong, and what we need to do to realize a broader concept of health justice in America. Is that our palatable to all y'all help with me on that? But start describing kind of the, the world we have now, what we've got now. We have created a world in which the costs of receiving health care are much, much more than any individual person can afford by themselves, right? But not a lot of folks need health care in a given year. In a given year, 50% of all medical costs come from 5% of the population. 80% of all medical costs come from 20% of the population. And that's not a, that's a fungible population, right? Sometimes costs bounce around. Some years you give birth to a child, some years you hit by a car, some years you have a heart attack or a cancer scare, and other years you don't. So when costs hit, they hit pretty hard. So if everyone had to pay all their own costs, eventually millions of people would go into crushing debt from medical bankruptcy. It's not a guess. That used to be the way healthcare was financed. That's history. That's what happened. And it wasn't until the 1880s when a bunch of socialists and a bunch of unionists demanded that letting folks go into poverty because of sickness wasn't acceptable that we shifted to a new payer model, the idea of insurance. Now, insurers are companies that receive revenue by charging you monthly premiums. When someone gets sick, insurers spend a portion of the money they collect from everyone to pay a portion of those health care costs plus the profit for themselves. So the more revenue an insurer receives from its customers, or realistically, the more subsidy it gets from public money, the wider those costs are spread and the lower the insurer's per person costs. But because getting sick is expensive, if an insurer has too many sick people, those per person costs increase, which means they gotta increase premiums. But when premiums go up, people that can't afford them drop out, unless they're sick and they need the insurance, so they stay aboard, so per person costs keep going up, so premiums keep going up, until this big, dumb, vicious stuff. So thus, an insurer wants as large and as healthy a customer base as possible. Or, it wants to find ways to legally or illegally kick out sick customers or coerce them into leaving. That's what we need. We need to live in a world in which health care is a commodity, right? Because future's on your heart, future's on your lungs, and your Mimos chance of getting diabetes, and whether or not her glaucoma gets better or worse before age 65 as you go to Medicare, are bought and sold for profit by private companies. This fragmented, commodified healthcare model views healthcare as a transaction that only happens when you're insured, instead of a relationship between a person, their body, and their doctors. That's perverted. We have mistaken the profit motives of insurers for healthcare. So why we delegate the responsibility of providing insurance to employers? But that's messed up too, because that results in the status quo of total employer domination in which your access to things like contraception, or blood transfusions, or hormone therapies are determined by the whims of your employer. 
And so every single year, labor unions are forced to fight corporations for worse and more expensive insurance instead of being free to organize on better wages, better contracts, and workplace safety. But if you aren't lucky enough to have an employer, right? If you lack the better skills to get the finite number of better jobs, you're left behind. The people who profit from the commodification of our bodies have decided it is acceptable to shackle the well-being of children to whether or not their parents are lucky enough to have gone back in time 40 years, learned to code, and found a benevolent employer. So welcome to the hell world of America 2017. But of course it gets worse. It's way too early in this week for things not to get worse. Because the costs of health care keep increasing. And they increase much, much faster than inflation. Now, they increase for reasons that are good, and they increase for reasons that are bad. Bad reasons include providers providing unnecessary care. Bad reasons include sticker prices uh, <coughs> being, being grossly inflated. Take, for example, MRIs. Uh, you guys know MRIs? MRIs are just a big, fancy machine that prints money. Uh, uh, in the U.S., average cost of an MRI procedure is five times when that same machine, same procedure costs in Australia. So we've got a bunch of stupid ways that costs are going up, but also got good ones, right? More people live in long and chronic conditions. Diabetes, heart attacks, cancer, are hardly immediate death sentences they were uh, uh, even two or three generations ago. So we spend more money to take care of more people so they can live longer, better lives. That's good. But all in all, these rising costs scare the bejesus out of everybody involved, particularly insurers, right? Because insurers are interested in finding ways to mitigate rising costs. Sometimes that means refusing to pay for claims. You've all heard those horror stories, even if it happened to you or somebody you love. Before the Affordable Care Act, it often meant that payers would often refuse to cover people who were or who were likely to get sick. You all know the phrase, pre-existing conditions. But this still wasn't driving costs down. So we all, the people of America, got together back in the 1970s and invented the idea of consumer-driven health care. It's the idea that you should make consumers, which is just a libertarian way of saying people, pay more than the costs of their own health care, right? Because once people are on the their own health care costs, they'll turn into smart shoppers somehow, through the power of the free market or whatever. They'll like shop around and not get unnecessary care or too expensive care. They'll find the cheapest ER in town if they get hit by a car. They'll like help their surgeons. And all of this together will drive prices down. But all of this built an atomized, isolationist, and honestly pretty lonely world worldview of what healthcare can, what healthcare should be, right? It treats being sick or being poor, or being able to get pregnant as a character flaw. And that means if you get by a car, or you give birth to a premature baby, or you get rabies, you're on the hook for your own costs, because it's your responsibility, because health care is a matter of personal accountability. And if that accident, or if that illness, or if that pregnancy forces you into a lifetime of crushing debt or medical bankruptcy, so the hospital, your insurer, close personal friend Martin Shkreli, or other, another part of that, you know, if you turn a profit, it's a tough shit. That's the bricks. Consumer-driven healthcare only serves the people who seek to extract profit from our bodies. So what do you do, right? How do you square the rampant increase of healthcare costs with the fact that, fundamentally, insuring sick people isn't profitable? Well, if you're the Democrats, you collaborate with the Heritage Foundation to offer us the Affordable Care Act, which is, at its core, the massive subsidization of private industry with public money, right? The ACA is a bargain, a, a, a plaintiff whale. Please, 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 how many billions of dollars do we got to give you so you stop being sick people off your insurance? Now, they aciated some things that are unquestionably good. First and foremost, among them, the expansion of Medicaid. In states where Medicaid was expanded, where the governor was decent enough to give people a shot at Medicaid, mortality rates dropped by 5.1%. Political 11.1% among communities of color. Medicaid is the single most effective anti-poverty program in the U.S. And so when Greg Abbott refuses to expand Medicaid, or refuses to uh, try to push bills through that let them restrict how Medicaid money is, uh, is being spent, that's a uh, direct assault. Uh, on, on poor people. It's an anti-poor measure couched in the language of the anti-choice movement. And the reason for Medicaid being so effective, we all understand that, right? We've got people who have been systematically denied access to health care for their entire life and given them even the basic decency of Medicaid, which is not, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful program, but isn't financed nearly what it should be. It does a shit of a lot real fast to bring people's quality of life up and extend, uh, extend their life. But at the end of the day, costs keep increasing. 
right? Mm -hmm. Quality of care stagnates for the most vulnerable among us, and 28 million people are still uninsured. Thus, the ACA has failed in its pursuit of health justice. This big, dumb, Rube Goldberg machine of American healthcare is going to fail, and when it fails, it will be remade or replaced. Instead, we demand a federal, universal, single payer. Now, single payer is a pretty simple concept, right? Instead of having a bunch of different insurers with a bunch of fragmented customer bases, each seeking to kind of avoid taking care of unprofitable sick people who pass the buck, we have one publicly owned, publicly funded insurer with a legislative mandate to cover in full all care for all people. Now that phrase, all care for all people, is important. We want to fund all kinds of care for all kinds of people, including undocumented people and others that are left behind. We have the money, we can afford to do so. We want to build a strengthened Medicare for All program. We take Medicare as it exists now, takes parts A, B, and D, merge them together, and make them more expansive. It's kind of like the like, piecework thing that was built over the past 50 years. And develop a program that offers comprehensive coverage for all people in America, including long-term care for people with disabilities, that is free at the point of service with no cost change. When Medicare was first debated, the American Medical Association fought against it. It insisted that uh, letting the government into the patient-provider relationship would amount to total chaos and total health. So instead, we handed it to private payers. And now the question of who's paying for that care dominates that relationship completely. When you go to the hospital, the first question they ask you, even before your name is, is who's the insurer? Who's paying for this? How do I guarantee I'm not accidentally providing uncompensated care? Now, under a single-payer system, the question of who's paying for it is answered. It's Medicare. We preserve and protect the provider-patient relationship by eliminating the question of how can the patient afford this in the first place. Because everybody benefits from accessing care as affordable or easy, right, or free. Delivering care, being a doctor, being a nurse, that's just complicated. Bodies are big bags of ephemeral goo that we barely understand. Making them feel better is complicated shit, but paying for it isn't. Paying for it is simple. And in fact, we're already paying for it. We're just forced to spend that money really, really stupidly. American public money right now pays for two-thirds of all health care costs in America. A little less than half of that two-thirds, aka one-third overall, is actual Medicare, Medicaid, or VA spending. Other half of that two-thirds is direct government subsidies to private companies. That remaining third is out-of-pocket costs, an additional tax you pay to insurers in the form of premiums, deductibles, and co-pays all for the privilege of insufficient insurance. And so the goal is not necessarily to reduce this gross level of federal spending, um, although under a uh, Bernie Sanders' bill, for example, the average uh, family of whole four making $40,000 a year sees their out-of-pocket costs go from $5,300 per year to $470 per year, but to reallocate this to take care of everybody long term. We know that Medicare negotiates much, much better prices for care because it bargains on behalf of 44 million people nationwide instead of a few hundred thousand in a given state or a given city. So you scale that idea up, right? By negotiating on behalf of 300 million people, Medicare can demand fair prices for care and develop the payment models required to incentivize good behavior and take care of the labor that provides the care in the first place. But before that even happens, we free up all the money associated with administrative costs and overhead and profit within the private insurance market. This optimization, in their terms, this innovation, <coughs> opens up, in a conservative estimate, an additional $370 billion a year. It's a big fucking chunk of change. What do we do with it? Well, we use it to improve everyone's standard of living nationwide. Sometimes you can get a lower level of care at home. Maybe you just need injections or physical therapies or someone to look after you, right? Home is a much better place to get care. It's where your dog lives. It's where the computer lives. Uh, so you get cheaper and more humane care. You, get, you provide care to people in the comfort of their, in the safety of their own home instead of forcing them into a private hospital. So everybody benefits, right? It's more humane and we save money. Well, everybody benefits except for the home health aides themselves. There'll be 1.2 million home health aides by the year 2020. Right now, they're billed at an average of $153 per visit, but they're paid nationwide an average of only $11 an hour. So we can allocate this money to do what the private market won't, what it refuses to do, which is pay fair wages for essential care that helps everyone. Right? Oh, hell yeah. receiving care 
it right now. Because you're likely to change insurers in the future and eventually go on Medicare, insurers don't actually feel any pressure at all trying to care that keeps you healthy even the distant or even the near-term future, right? Instead, we all do, right? Because we all suffer when our friends and family get sick and our public money is allocated to care for folks in time of crisis. So it makes perfect sense that the same actor who suffers when people don't get care, which is all of us united, we're represented by our federal government, should also be the actor who pays for that care in the first place, right? Because once the federal actor, once that federal single payer bears the costs of providing care and the risks and costs of not providing care, it can finally be used as a tool for realizing health justice. If people are getting sick and dying because they don't have a place to live, or the places to live are unsafe, they're full of pollution, they're full of mold, they're flammable, I'm thinking of Ghost Ship in Oakland or the Grenfell Towers in the UK, then housing is health care. And you build free or subsidized housing to bring health care costs down. If people are getting sick and dying because they don't have access to healthy food to eat, and so they're getting diabetes or comorbidities like cardiac failure, then food is health care. And you provide people with affordable or free food options and the time, space, and materials with which prepare to bring health care costs down. If people are getting sick and dying, they don't have access to uh, needle exchange programs, therapy, or counseling, then rehabilitation is healthcare, and you build addiction treatment programs. Not our current end-of-life palliative care bullshit, but the full social safety net required to handle addiction, or perhaps not pursue it in the first place to bring healthcare costs down. Because single payer isn't the goal. Single payer is only the tool. Health Justice is the goal. And when we fight for health justice, we all fight side by side because economic justice is health justice. Environmental justice is health justice. Reproductive justice is health justice. And justice for black lives, justice for trans lives, justice for the women, immigrants, and the well being of all people, regardless of age, gender, race, or creed, that's health justice. insurance because a bunch of socialists and a bunch of unionists scared the shit out of Ottawa and Bismarck and demanded something better. After World War II, once again, unions came to the fore and threatened national labor strikes in order to, uh, until they received national health programs. We live in the era of post-Reaganism. We live in the era of post-Thatcherism. The first thing you lose if you go on strike is your health care. And so unions have been made inadequate to handle the problem by themselves. We must build the massive popular movement that demands single payer. And there are many steps along the road, right? Paid sick leave being among them, Medicaid expansion among them. Yeah, here's a, man. here's a material benefit you can offer somebody, and you can fight alongside them in the broader vision, and the, uh, in, in that shared vision, that aspirational vision of a better world and a more just world that recognizes the inherent humanity and dignity within us all. Dignity for a working person to stay at home when they feel sick is dignity uh, uh, that, that benefits everybody. And so we can build this popular movement shoulder to shoulder. And we must. We must by beginning demanding the material conditions around us and then demanding single payer from our government and then continuing to demand health justice in our nation. And when people tell us that we're bringing about creeping socialism, that we're rejecting the American way of life, the American capitalist way of life, we say, yeah, dog. <laughs> <laughs> your permission to receive health care, capital's allowance that you can be safe in your own body is dependent upon how much an insurer can extract a profit from you. When people are in need, we waste time, effort, and money means testing, separating the worthy from the unworthy among those who need help and then stigmatizing them instead of guaranteeing the basic decency of health equity. And for systematically marginalized people, sick people, homeless people, people struggling with addiction, people with disabilities, poor people, pregnant people, trans people, women, people of color. But when there's no way for the medical industrial complex to find that profit from their bodies, there's always the private prison system ready to receive them for profit. My friends, single payer is moral. 
Single payer is necessary. And single payer is achievable. Solidarity now, solidarity forever. Solidarity, y'all.